It would be impossible to teach students everything that is known about science. There's simply too much across too many different disciplines to cover everything as part of a standard education. So if schools don't have time to teach you everything that is known, they certainly won't have time to teach you everything that is unknown. Sometimes that's for simplicity's sake, with schools working around the unknown details to present as clear a picture as possible. Other times, these mysteries are so specific that they don't neatly fit into a core curriculum. From why time moves forward to brainless goo that might be smarter than people, today we'll be looking at five of these unsolved mysteries of science. You undoubtedly learned about the origins of life on Earth, at least to some degree. The story generally goes that sometime between 3.7 and 4 billion years ago, Earth was covered in a type of primordial soup containing carbon, hydrogen, water, and ammonia. Because all of the conditions were right, life emerged from this soup in the form of the first single-celled organisms. From there, you probably ran through the evolution of species, summarizing billions of years of evolution in a single lecture. And that's all well and good, but it still doesn't really explain how life began. If all that it takes for life to begin is the right elements exposed to specific atmospheric environments, then life should have sprung up all over the world. Not only that, but it should be something we can replicate in a lab. However, to the best of our knowledge, this process has happened exactly one time. Despite countless examples of convergent evolution and the fact that single-celled organisms are believed to have made the jump to multicellular life forms at least 25 times, the jump from non-living matter to life has only happened once in Earth's entire history. This process of life forming from non-living organic matter is known as abiogenesis, and it is the leading theory for how life began on Earth. Another theory is panspermia, though this is considered more of a fringe theory by most scientists. There are various theories of how panspermia could have happened, but the idea is that life didn't originate on Earth. Instead, life exists all across the universe and is distributed to planets, such as by a meteor crashing into the Earth, while it was carrying microbial life. Of course, that theory still doesn't explain how life began, instead just offering a mechanism by which it could propagate throughout the universe. But while abiogenesis might be a widely accepted theory, it's still unproven. Not only that, but we don't really understand how this would even be possible. However, while laboratory tests haven't been able to recreate abiogenesis, they have produced results that support the theory. By recreating early Earth conditions, scientists were able to create a variety of organic compounds, including amino acids, lipids, and nucleotides. It's speculated that some external force may have precipitated these reactions, such as lightning or radiation. The research has been promising, but it has yet to conclusively prove that this was how life truly began on Earth. The Mopemba effect is actually two mysteries rolled into one. The first mystery is whether or not this is even a real thing, and the second is how it would be possible if it is. The Mopemba effect is the name for the observation that hot liquid will freeze faster than cold liquid. It gets its name from Arasta Mopemba, who was a 13-year-old secondary school student in Tanzania at the time of his observation. Mopemba was taking a cooking class at the time, and he and his classmates were instructed to boil a mixture of cream and sugar, let it cool off, and then place it in the freezer. Worried that there wouldn't be enough room for everyone, Mopemba placed his mixture directly into the freezer without letting it cool down first. Roughly 90 minutes later, when he returned to check on the mixture, Mapemba discovered that his batch had frozen while his classmates had not. Intrigued, he asked his physics teacher why this would happen, but the teacher dismissed the question entirely, stating that it was impossible. And, well, that does make sense. From everything that we understand about physics and thermodynamics, the hot sample should freeze much slower than the colder sample, assuming everything else was equal. The answer didn't satisfy Mapemba, though. A few years later, when British physicist Dennis Osborne came to the school to give a guest lecture, Mapemba raised his hand to ask a question. He stated that if two equal samples of water, one boiling and one room temperature, are placed in a freezer, the hottest sample would freeze first. He then asked Osborne why that would be the case. Though Osborne was caught off guard, by the question and didn't have an answer, Mapemba had confidently stated his assertion as fact. Osborne decided to recreate the experiment with both water and cream, and both experiments supported Mapemba's initial observation. They published a paper together in 1969, and from there, the Mapemba effect has gained notoriety. However, this wasn't the first time that somebody made this observation, not by a long shot. There are several high-profile examples of historical figures making note of the same curious effect, with the oldest dating back to Aristotle. When Aristotle mentioned it, he wasn't bringing it 
up as an incredible and groundbreaking discovery either. The ancient Greek believed this was common knowledge, saying that people who wanted to cool water quickly would usually begin by putting it in the sun first. However, despite thousands of years of anecdotes and observations, modern scientists aren't convinced the Mpemba effect is even real. Some experiments confirm the initial observation, while others produce the more expected result that the colder liquid will freeze first. But if the effect is real, which experimentally seems to be true at least sometimes, there are nearly a dozen different theories on why this would be the case. Things such as convection, microbubble heat transfer, and dissolved gases have all been suggested as possible reasons for the apparent effect. And that last theory demonstrates one of the difficulties in testing this properly. In order to properly test the Mpemba effect, the two samples need to be identical. However, cold water can dissolve more gases than hot water. There could also be different types of quantities or impurities in the different samples. Because of how complicated some of the possible explanations get, even the precise molecular configuration of the containers might be a factor. These aren't impossible to control in a laboratory setting, but some of the variables get extremely difficult. Seeing as it's unclear how important a scientific revelation this would be, even if it were proven accurate, it's hard to justify that amount of time, care, and possibly expense. Since there are many observed cases, both supporting and refuting the Mbemba effect, the best we can say is to just freeze water at whatever temperature you like. As you've been watching this video, you have been experiencing the passage of time. While you may not have been paying attention to the exact amount of time that has passed since you first hit play, you can recognize that the time has been moving forward. Most likely, you didn't even think about the fact because time always moves forward and you're so absorbed in this video. But why does it work that way? Why does time move forward? In a way, it started with Isaac Newton, though it wasn't recognized until quite some time later. When Newton created his three laws of motion, they were good. They were bloody good. These laws were able to explain the world around us and make predictions with an incredible degree of accuracy. It didn't matter whether the objects were big or small, close together or far apart, no matter what the scenario, Newton's laws always held up. But what people eventually realized is that Newton's laws were so efficient, they worked regardless of which direction time was flowing. It only took so long for anyone to realize this because no one had really considered time flowing in another direction as a real possibility. This isn't limited to just Newton's work either. The same was true for Einstein's theories of relativity, Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism, and even all of the theories related to quantum mechanics. Despite time clearly flowing at a constant rate in a specific direction, every single scientific theory and law describing how the universe functions continues to work no matter what direction time is flowing in. That is, every law except for one, the second law of thermodynamics. In 1865, German physicist Rudolf Clausius created the second law of thermodynamics and the concept of entropy. The second law states that entropy can only ever increase and never decrease. This was based on the simple observation that heat cannot transfer from a cold object to a hot one. The concept of entropy, described scientifically as disorder or randomness, is the only scientific law that requires time to flow in a specific direction. It creates the arrow of time, moving the universe from a state of lower entropy to one of higher entropy. However, though this answers the question of why time flows in the direction that it does, it raises an even bigger question. Why does time flow in the direction that it does? More specifically, why did the universe at the time of the Big Bang have such an incredibly low entropy? Not only is that a question that we're yet to answer, it's one that some scientists believe has been underexplored. People have chosen to accept that it just did, essentially sweeping the problem under the rug to deal with later. It also raises all sorts of other questions as well. How would the universe differ had it been in a state of high entropy during the Big Bang, and why is there only a single law in all of science that cares about what direction time moves in, to name just a couple? Those are questions that we may never be able to answer, but perhaps science will someday find a satisfactory answer to why the Big Bang had such low entropy, and thus why we experience time the way that we do. You may have learned in school that there are four fundamental forces in the universe. The electromagnetic force, the weak nuclear force, the strong nuclear force, and gravity. Or, depending on how much you hated and avoided science classes, you may have only learned about gravity and perhaps electromagnetism. The strong nuclear force is, as you might have guessed by the name, the strongest of the fundamental forces. It is what binds subatomic particles together. The weak nuclear force describes the interactions between subatomic particles, as well as being responsible for things like radioactive decay of atoms, nuclear 
fission and nuclear fusion. Electromagnetism deals with how particles with an electric charge interact with one another. Those all deal with a microscopic scale, while gravity, which is the weakest of the forces by 30 orders of magnitude, deals with how objects interact on the macroscopic scale. But what if those four forces were actually all the same thing. Once upon a time, there was another force. Electricity and magnetism were once thought to be unrelated forces, but in 1820, Danish physicist Hans Christian Ørsted discovered that an electrical wire hooked up to a battery could deflect the needle of a nearby compass. Following this discovery, the two previously unrelated forces were unified to create the electromagnetic force. And this has happened again more recently. Previous research results suggested, though seemingly unrelated at the sort of low energy levels that most experiments were conducted at, at high enough energy levels, like when the temperature is 10 to the power of 15 Kelvin or higher, the electromagnetic force and weak nuclear force should unify. This theory existed for decades, with no real way to test it, but thanks to super colliders, scientists can now create a high enough energy state at which this theory can be tested. And at those high energy levels, the two forces do in fact merge into a singular electroweak force. The maths can be extended even further, and at the higher energy levels, the electroweak force should merge with the strong nuclear force, and then with gravity at absolutely ludicrous energy levels. However, while the maths all checks out, we don't actually have any way to test this, especially with gravity. Using currently available technology, we would need to construct a super collider approximately 1,000 light years in diameter in order for all four fundamental forces to unite into a singular force. But even though we can't test that, Yet, all the math says that this should work. If true, it would mean that the universe is not held together by multiple different forces, but instead by a singular force that acts in multiple different ways at lower energy levels. This is one of the potential building blocks of a grand unified theory of physics, yet it remains just out of reach. Although the maths all seems to work, there are times where experimental data has contradicted our best maths-based predictions. In fact, it was one of these contradictions that led to the electroweak force being theorized about in the first place. Someday, science will likely find an answer to the question of whether or not the four fundamental forces really do unify, but we're going to need a way to generate a lot more energy first. Slime molds are a type of protist single-cell organism that are neither plant, animal, nor fungus. There are many different types of slime mold, but perhaps the most interesting is Physerum polycephalum. Although slime molds are technically called cells, these cells can join together to form larger blobs of slime. It's these larger blobs that are of particular interest. These blobs of cells work together for a singular goal, sometimes to their own detriment. For example, they can grow into spores atop tall stalks as a means to spread out and reproduce but it's all the same type of cell. The cells that become the stalks are no different than the cells that become the spores, but they are tasked with withering and dying for the benefit of other cells. Usually, however, the cell's cooperation is beneficial for all parties involved. Not only that, but their abilities are remarkably complex. When a slime mold is placed in a maze, it will easily traverse the maze to find a food source. Now, that's not too impressive by itself, but the behavior gets a lot more interesting when multiple food sources are introduced. The slime first spreads out, exploring Exploring the entire maze, then it retracts so that all that remains is a thin strand of slime connecting the two food sources. Most impressively, if there are multiple different paths through the maze, it will almost always choose the shortest route. So what happens when the mazes and locations of food get even more complex? A slime mold was placed in the center of a petri dish, with the original location of the slime representing Tokyo. Researchers then used 38 oat flakes to represent the other major cities in the greater Tokyo area. Because the slime avoids light, light sources were used to represent impassable mountains and other bodies of water. After spreading out to find the food and then contracting, the resulting shape of the slime was nearly identical to the existing Tokyo train system with comparable efficiency, fault tolerance, and cost. And while it likely took engineers months if not years to map out the best possible railway system, the slime did it in 26 hours. Not only are they able to solve complex computational problems that even computers sometimes find challenging, they can learn from one another as well. The slime molds naturally avoid salt. However, scientists taught two slime molds to cross a salt bridge in order to reach a food source. Two of these trained slimes were then placed on either side of an untrained slime. After connecting with one another and sharing information, a process that is measured as taking roughly an hour, the untrained slime readily charged across the salt bridge to reach the food at the other end. 
end. Now, at this point, you might be thinking that this is all pretty neat, but what exactly is the mystery here? After all, laboratory animals learn impressive stuff all the time. And while that may be true, it's important to remember the slime molds aren't animals. They are single-celled organisms grouped together. These cells have nothing resembling a brain, and American biologist John Bonner, famous for pioneering research with slime molds, has described them as being no more than a bag of amoeba encased in a thin slime sheath. So how do these cells learn? Where do they store their memories? And how can one slime mold transmit learned information to another? These are questions that scientists simply don't have answers to yet. All we know for sure is that so far there is literal brainless slime that is able to outperform computers at some types of complex problem solving. 